Hello and welcome to the channel again. Uh, today we are joined with Dr. Thomas Seafried. Um, Dr. Thomas Seafried, would you, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, Jason. Nice to be here. Uh, uh, Professor Seafried Thomas from Boston College. And um, we are doing metabolic therapy for managing cancer. And I teach cancer metabolism here to advanced students as well as uh, in our general biology uh, program. And we emphasize um, scientific literacy. It's very important for people to understand uh, science. And um, we find it very uh, interesting that the world is run by uh, science and technology and very few people understand anything about science and technology. So uh, it also helps to try to educate yourself. So cancer patients in this, in this particular sphere are better able to understand their disease and recognize um, logical therapeutic strategies that might be uh, appropriate for their condition. So um, feel free to ask me any questions that you might have related to the, the cancer problem. So your main focus of study is metabolic therapy. And so a lot of people, when they hear the words metabolic therapy, they don't exactly know what that is or how it works. If you could just talk about metabolic therapy, that's been your big breadwinner over the years and showing a lot of promise or just su success in the lab, pure success. Yeah, well, a success in the lab as well as success in the clinic as well. Mm -hmm. um, what has what has we, we, we and others have come to know is that cancer is essentially a metabolic problem. Um, and and uh, we, energy is the central issue for everything. Uh, a, a cell cannot grow without energy. Uh, so cancer cells are growing in a dysregulated way, and that's the definition of cancer, dysregulated cell growth. So you have to say to yourself, well, where's the energy coming from uh, for these cells to grow in a dysregulated way? Because without energy, nothing can grow anyway. So, um, so the field is, seems to be <clears throat> focused heavily on mutations. <coughs> Excuse me. But um, with the promise that precision medicine and this kind of thing uh, will eventually replace the need for toxic chemicals, chemotherapy, and radiation. If we can look at mutations in cancer cells and target those mutations called precision medicine or personalized therapy or these kinds of things. Um, we can then maybe make advances. Um, well, that, that strategy is based on the somatic mutation theory of cancer, which is the driver, uh, the driving theory for all of the major cancer centers throughout the world, the National Cancer Institute here in the United States and wherever else, Canadian Cancer Institutes and English, German, France, they're all of the opinion <coughs> that cancer is a genetic disease and personalized medicine is going to be the future. The, the important issue here is that that's incorrect. Uh, that theory is now de debunked massively by information that's in, in the literature that people uh, do not uh, or do not ignore, basically. So we have found and others have found based on the work of Otto Warburg and others that no cancer cell can grow uh, without energy through fermentation. Uh, rather than through oxidative phosphorylation. We're all breathing. We get energy from oxidative phosphorylation because we use oxygen to keep the cells alive, making energy. But cancer cells don't, they take in oxygen. The problem is they don't use it for making energy. They, they rely on these ancient fermentation pathways where they use glucose and the, and the amino acid glutamine. And these two fuels are uh, used in the absence of oxygen. Even, even if oxygen is present, they're still being fermented. That's a, a, a pathway that does not involve oxygen. So we have discovered this. And people all know that glucose and glutamine are essential for tumor growth. The problem, the problem is that they all feel that glucose and glutamine are respired, uh, not fermented. And the, the, this is the big <clears throat> conundrum. How do these fuels produce energy? Is it through uh, respiration with oxygen or is it fermentation, ancient pathways? Once you realize they're ancient pathways, then you know how to kill them. You just take away glucose and glutamine while transitioning the body over to nutritional ketosis because the tumor cells can't burn ketones. Why? Because their oxidative phosphorylation system is defective. So once people understand that cancer cells 
don't need oxygen to grow. They ferment and they, they only ferment glucose and glutamine. Then we know how to kill them. And when you do it, it works really well. Uh, the problem is very few people understand this or accept it because they haven't read the scientific literature, number one, or they choose to ignore it uh, at, 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 uh, at, at the, the demise of the cancer patients. So, um, yeah, I, I know. And, and people say, well, I don't understand what you're saying. Well, I'm saying I published all this. It's open access literature. And I, as I said, um, scientific literacy is essential. You, you want to know what I'm saying? You better be sci scientific literature, literate. And if you're not scientific literate, you better, better get on the bandwagon real quick uh, and start understanding what the hell I'm saying because it's published out there. And I try to write it in such, and I'm sorry if it's a little bit too deep for some people, but listen, your life is on the line. Many of these cancer patients, and I'm always amazed. You'd be surprised when your life is on the line, how smart you become in a relatively short period of time. It's unbelievable. I wish my students sometimes would, uh, would, would, would get on the, on the bandwagon as fast as some of these cancer patients. I've had some cancer patients, they never graduated, uh, they graduated from high school, nothing further. And they're able to understand some of these concepts because they work hard at trying to understand them. And the next thing you know, when they understand it, now they know what to do and how to do what they're trying to do to kill cancer cells. The problem is the biggest block right now is the systems. As I said, the, the National Cancer Institutes of all the major uh, hospitals and uh, um, government institutions still think cancer is a genetic disease, thereby immunotherapy that you, a lot of people are taking based on the somatic mutation theory of cancer. It, it's, it, it's not a meta. You can target the glucose and glutamine and get a very similar result, if not better. So, so uh, again, it all comes down to the theory under which the approaches, the procedures are being used. So again, you have to understand the difference between the somatic mutation theory and the mitochondrial metabolic theory. And we've published a number of papers in this area so people can get an understanding. Why are you not treating me with metabolic therapy based on the true understanding of what the disease is? Why are you continuing to treat me with therapies based on the somatic mutation, which has now been undermined and debunked? And most people in the clinics, would, if, if you were to, a cancer patient would say that to an oncologist, the oncologist would look at you like a deer in the headlight. He would have no clue about what you're talking about. And this is the tragedy because neither the patient nor the caregiver really understand the nature of what cancer is. So once you understand what it's a metabolic disorder, then the, both the patient and the oncologist can work together as a team and manage the cancer effectively without toxicity. How long will it take for this to happen? I have no idea. Hopefully sooner than later. <laughs> yeah, let's hope so. Um, so if I could re reiterate what you're saying, the way that when you're talking about all this stuff, I see it in my head is because this all was originally discovered by Otto Warburg, um, that a uh, cancer cell will continue to grow even in the presence of oxygen, glycolysis occurs. So the way I see it, it's like trying to brew a big barrel of wine and you put all the wine in, but normally with wine, you got to seal the lid to keep the, the air out after you put in the sugar, you put in the sugar seal the wine to keep out the oxygen and it makes wine. But in this case, you don't even need to bother throwing the top of well, well, uh, well let's 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 go back on that wine thing. You you can put the water and the grapes and the sugar actually you don't put much sugar in there. The wine the grapes have the sugar already in there. Hmm. So so but you need an organism uh to produce uh uh to 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 create the to put the sugar back to alcohol and let the and let the wine age. And that's yeast. So the yeast uh, take the sugar from the grapes and they it's called alcoholic fermentation. All right. That's called alcoholic fermentation. So the yeast produces the alcohol using the sugar from the grapes. And then you uh, uh, age them in these barrels and you get you get the wine. The difference between making uh, wine and, and the, uh, growing cancer is that the it is a fermentation process, but it, in cancer it's called lactic acid fermentation rather than alcoholic fermentation. So the cancer cell will take the sugar and convert it into lactic acid and, and, the, and, the, and the building blocks to grow the tumor cell. So, and the waste, the waste product in wine uh, is alcohol. That's, that's uh, the waste product in cancer is lactic acid, okay? So lactic acid is now dumped outside of the cancer cell creating an, an acidified inflamed microenvironment. And that inflamed microenvironment also prevents 
many chemotherapies and immunotherapies from working because the waste product of the tumor is blocking some of these other therapies from working themselves. So how do you stop lactic? Where's the lactic acid coming from? It's coming from the sugar in the bloodstream. Okay. So, and the amino acid glutamine, they produce succinic acid. So the acids dumped out of cancer cells are the waste products of the fermentable fuels driving the dysregulated cell growth. So if you want to stop cancer, you have to stop the fuels that are producing the acids. And that's the glucose and the glutamine. And you use a, a combination of diets and drugs that simultaneously shut down the fermentable fuels, which are glucose and glutamine. And that reduces the acidification in the microenvironment, allowing a multitude of different therapies to now work and kill the tumor cells. So right now we're not doing any of that. And that creates a big problem because the waste products are blocking other therapies from working and also allowing the cancer cell to continue to grow and produce more acid. So, so it's an escalating situation of biological chaos. And we've created a monster by some of the therapies that we, that we try to do. We do surgical mutilation. That's okay and will cure cancer as long as they haven't spread outside the local, localized area because they'll come back at you. And some of these tumor cells are already seeding throughout the body. And, and a lot of the therapies create systemic inflammation, making them grow even more. So a lot of the things that we're doing to manage cancer are based on a la foundational lack of knowledge. And one would never do this if they really understood the, the real biology of the problem they're working with. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Think about that for a minute, what I'm saying. Very unbelievable. Like when you go in to see your oncologist, they don't talk about any of this stuff. They just give you an insurer and everybody gets an insurer and they walk around with a cookie. When I was at getting immune therapy last week, they walked around with chocolates, those little sea yeah. shell ones that are delicious. Well, we, we and others have published many, many papers showing that the, there is a direct correlation between how fast the tumor will grow and how high your blood sugar is. So insure will certainly uh, elevate the blood sugar and uh, rescue uh, tumor cells from death. So, uh, um, uh, and thus allowing them at some point in the future to grow in a more aggressive way. So if you want your tumor to survive and grow faster, you have to help elevate your blood sugar as high as you can get it. So, uh, um, uh, and apparently, uh, this is what's happening to a lot of people. And then they become surprised that the tumor is growing or where did it come from? How come it came back? I thought it was under control. Uh, and all of a sudden it recurs. Well, how could it recur when I was drinking all this and sure and eating all these candies? Um, and that's because that's the gasoline for the fire. And, and what you're doing is just doing that. And there's many, many papers in the literature, both for all major cancers. The higher the blood sugar you get for that person that has that cancer, the faster that tumor will grow. So how is it possible that some, everybody knows, I think most people would understand that if they had a, a, a fire in their backyard, with leaves or wood burning things up. I think most people would know that if I threw lighter fluid on that fire, the flames would get bigger. Um, uh, there's two reasons for that. Number one, you have oxygen there. And number, and number two, you have an accelerant, okay? So in cancer, th th they have the accelerant uh, doesn't need oxygen. This is the most amazing thing. The cancer cell does not use the oxygen like normal cells do but the accelerant would be the fermentable fuels. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and so you don't want to put accelerant, you don't want to give more fermentable fuels to the cancer cell. And uh, insure and chocolates and things like this, like you mentioned, are accelerants. And um, people should know that. And uh, you should avoid it, I think. Get the, you want to get those accelerants to the lowest level. And that's why you have the glucose ketone index, because what's happening there is that it measures blood sugar lower. The lower you get your sugar and the higher you get your ketones, which are a non-fermentable fuel. So that's an alternative to glucose and glutamine. These ketones cannot be fermented. So your normal cells start burning the normal, the ketones. The tumor cells can't burn the ketones because they have a defective resp respiratory mechanism. Their mitochondria don't, uh, don't uh, effectively get energy. So yeah, you have to, Transition the body to a non-fermentable fuel while sim simultane simultaneously targeting uh, the two fermentable fuels, and then you'll have uh, you'll take control. You'll, you'll have a, a control over uh, the dysregulated cell growth, which is ultimately what cancer is. You mentioned lactic 
acid. Mm -hmm. um, would working out and adding additional lactic acid to the body also be harmful or no? It's just the lactic acid being produced by the cancer cell itself that's the issue. Yeah, well, that's that goes back to a very important biochemical phenomenon. It's called the Cori cycle. So Saul and Gertie Cori uh, received the Nobel Prize for their discovery of the um, Cori cycle. Now, and here's the way that works. So when you do really vigorous exercises, your muscles consume, the oxygen to the muscles is not capable of generating uh, sufficient energy for the contraction of the muscles. So the muscles have stored sugar called glycogen in the muscle, and that's being burned faster than the oxygen can be used to respire the glycogen. So the glycogen forms lactic acid. And the lactic acid coming out of the muscles from super exercised muscles goes back into the bloodstream. And, and the liver picks up the lactic acid and converts it into glucose. So two lactic acid molecules are made into a glucose molecule, which then comes back to the muscle to restore the glycogen reserves in the muscle. That's called the Cori cycle. So if you were to uh, give a large amount of lactic acid to a cancer patient, what would happen is that the lactic acid would go to the liver and the liver would convert the lactic acid into glucose, thereby feeding the cancer. So uh, you don't want to do that. You, you, you don't want to give a cancer patient a large amount of lactic acid. As a, as a matter of fact, the cancer cell is throwing out the lactic, going back into the bloodstream, being converted to glucose and coming back to the cancer cell. So again, it's, it's a Cori cycle uh, 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 feeding the cancer cells. So no, the answer is that's not what you would want to do. Uh, is give, and you can see that if you drink, if cancer patients were to drink lactic acid or lactate, uh, you would elevate blood sugar, and that would be counterproductive to the success of what you're trying to do. Okay, so one of the ways to reduce glutamine in the system is to do light exercise while fasting. So if you're fasting, you're not uptaking glucose, but if you're doing mild exercise, that reduces glutamine too, right? Yeah. Okay. So glutamine needs drugs. Uh, yes. You, if you do vigorous exercise, you can lower glutamine. If you do a lot of exercise without eating, you can lower both glucose and glutamine. So this is the way we evolved as, as in the paleolithic ancestry of our existence on the planet. Uh, we all emerged as hunter gatherers for, uh, you know, three to 500,000 years. We were had a lot of exercise and uh, minimal, uh, and the foods that we ate were extremely low glycemic kinds of foods. So, so uh, uh, we would have low glucose and we would have low glutamine. But for cancer, uh, that certainly helps. Exercise um, and uh, restricted restricted consumption of carbohydrates or highly processed carbohydrates. Uh, but the glutamine is still there, and you don't. The cancer cell doesn't need a lot of glutamine. Uh, glucose is the bigger consumed fuel but they need that glutamine uh, to build DNA and RNA and this kind of thing. So um, that's why we need drugs that will target the glutamine availability. And uh, that works together with the diet and exercise. So it's called a, um, a metabolic therapy cocktail. And that cocktail is a combination of glutamine targeting drugs together with um, a therapeutic ketosis and exercise. A and that seems to be the best course of action uh, for the successful management of cancer, while at the same time enhancing, enhancing and improving the health and vitality of the normal cells of the body, all based on uh, foundational bioenergetic principles of energy metabolism. What kind of, so basically a ketogenic diet, but what kind of ketogenic diet seems to work the best, like a carnivore diet, a Mediterranean diet, just a ketogenic diet, what, what seems to get the best results? Any diet that will that will uh, facilitate the lowering of the glucose ketone index, and and it's also you have to have cultural and religious implications on this as well. So um, and as I said, I, I don't know uh, what diet is works best. Every individual would have to determine that for themselves. If you're a vegan or a car, or a, a, a vegetarian, you would have to eat your diet. Uh, and, and adjust the con composition or the content of what you're eating to see how well it brings you into a low GKI. And same if you're a carnivore or a pescatarian or Mediterranean, I don't care what it is. Uh, each person would have to determine what they like to eat, 
uh, how much they can eat to keep a, a, and maintain a, a low a, a, a GKI of 2.0 or below. So it's it, it's an individual thing. It can't be it can't it can't be uh, uh, adjusted for the whole population of people. Everybody is their own unique person. So uh, again, uh, that person would have to determine what diet works best for them in keeping a low glucose ketone index GKI. Now, everybody that's been diagnosed with cancer is extremely stressed and living in tons of anxiety. Yeah. Um, well, most people, at least the people that are taking treatments and trying to fight and keep going forward. Um, it's just overwhelming. It's the worst depression you'll ever have in your life. So what effect does stress and depression have on cancer? Yeah, huge, huge. So when we published our uh, um, uh, press pulse strategy, uh, it, it also in, incorporates... Uh, stress management as a component in the um, uh, uh, reduction of, of dysregulated cell growth. Here's the situation. Just like you you, you mentioned, um, Jason, the stress, what does stress do to the body? Stress elevates glucocorticoids. When we're under stress, <clears throat> we elevate corticoids in preparation for dealing with stress. And uh, glucocorticoids elevate blood sugar in preparation for dealing with the stress. So that itself will contribute to the uh, dysregulated growth of the tumor cell. Um, so we have to have uh, strategies for stress management. <clears throat> Whether that uh, is music therapy, massage therapy, acupuncture therapy, prayer, wh whatever it is, it all has to work together to help to make sure the GKI is low. Because uh, we have exa exact examples of this. Um, I worked with a person one time with a, a type of brain cancer. Um, unfortunately, that person was lost because we weren't targeting glutamine. But we were looking at glucose. And she was handicapped from her brain tumor. And someone pulled in and took her handicapped uh, slot and, and made her very, very angry. And she measured her blood sugar and it went skyrocketing um but i said to her what is what is your ketone level and she said oh it's still pretty high so what we did was we divided the glucose by the ketones and we were able to show that the spike was not not so drastic as what would have been thought had you looked at glucose by itself and that singular observation from that one person allowed us to develop the, the formula for the glucose ketone index because it reduces the stress um, knowing that glucose, yes, is an essential metabolite for dri driving dysregulated cancer growth, but at the same time, ketones suppress that. And, and that burst of, uh, uh, of glucose coming from the arise of the glucocorticoids due to the anger and stress um, is less, less toxic or less, less stressful to know. So that's a way to reduce your anxiety uh, by just looking at GKI values and saying, oh, it wasn't that bad. Okay, now let me get back to a more normal condition. So once, I think I think some of the stress uh, comes from your lack, the lack of knowledge of what you're dealing with. Um, once you have a better appreciation and understanding of what cancer is and how it grows, then you can take action on yourself to, re to know that when I see my GKI going down, I am, I am becoming successful in managing my cancer. Therefore, you become in charge of your own existence. And when you know what you need to do and how to do it, stress, less levels of stress go down because now you understand things. But when you're completely ignorant or lack of knowledge about anything, then you get all freaked out and your stress level goes up because you have no clue what's going on. So once you have the understand the knowledge, then you are in control. And you can lower stress and you can do things that will lower stress knowing that it'll be killing tumor cells and therefore you become empowered. So this is an unbelievable way to re to reevaluate uh, uh, your whole uh, existence, uh, knowing that you are in control or you can do things to uh, help manage uh, the problem that you have. It's, a, it's all based on bioenergetics. Uh, the laws, uh, uh, these are, are fundamental laws of nature and uh, and they're, they're steeped in evolutionary biology. So this is why I say we understand cancer because we understand evolutionary biology and what's causing the dysregulated cell growth. And therefore, we become empowered. In Canada, it's legal.
for end of life cancer patients now, if you get approved by Health Canada mm -hmm. to use psilocybin magic mushrooms um, for end of life treatment. And that was based on many studies done at John Hopkins University and all kinds of places. Um, I actually was approved to do it and I did it with a doctor and a psycho psychiatrist on each side of me. And so they had like three meetings ahead of time. I had the four hour journey using psilocybin and then I had two exit interviews where they helped me integrate everything that I had learned and seen on the journey and talked to God. And it, it actually relieved 80% of my stress and fear of my own mortality and death and having the cancer. It really made a substantial impact on my depression and anxiety on the whole cancer situation as a whole. It would just really work miracles. So it's really, I guess that kind of backs up. There was a study done. Apparently I heard about it on a podcast recently in Canada. I was on Joe Rogan. But apparently there were 68 end-of-life cancer patients that had six months to live, kind of like me. Mm -hmm. And they they all did this psilocybin journey through Health Canada. And it's now been three years and only four of them have passed away. So the stress may have a huge role to play. In yeah, this well, game. you should also check and see what that's doing to the glucose ketone index. See if there's psilocybin uh, activity. You have to do it. You have to measure before and after or during and see, where, see whether or not it's also helping your GKI stay low. Um, so everything has to be measured by the bioenergetic availability of the fuels driving the dysregulated cell growth. And anything you can do to lower those fuels uh, will delay the inevitable. So if you're supposed to die in six months, uh, 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 and I love these kinds of predictions that they give people like, they, like they're God and they know exactly what's going to happen on Tuesday of May 4th or what, and the second Tuesday in May, you're going to be dead. I mean, how does anybody know something like that? You know, they come out and, and, you know, um, uh, but again, uh, whether you do mushrooms or whatever else you do, prayer, uh, whatever, always double check to see what effect it's having on your glucose ketone index. If it's keeping it stable and low, then continue to do that. And if you know it's getting lower, I mean, this is, you're, you're trying to link these things uh, with a with a quantitative bioenergetic marker to see whether or not you have these kinds of linkages. And if you're already approved to do these things, then you should measure your GKI before, during, and after to see whether or not you can actually get a bioenergetic readout for uh, uh, the whatever whatever supplement you're taking, uh, whatever you're doing to, to help manage your disorder. And then after a while, you see, well, I've been doing it now far longer than. Why I'm still doing this? It, it was like um, the guy um, Amadai was in the New York Times. The 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 Greek the Greek guy who uh, had developed lung cancer. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, his name was um, Amaditis Moratis Moralis. Mm -hmm. It's uh, back. I think I know it was in the 1960s. He he was diagnosed at I think Sloan Kettering with um, terminal lung cancer. And they wanted him to take all these things. He said no. He went back to his his uh, home in where he grew up in some small island in the in the Mediterranean, one of those Greek islands. And he he wanted to die peacefully in his village, and and he was given six months or something to live. And he was there, and he can, ate his natural Mediterranean diet, drank the red wine, hung out with his friends, and you know six months went by, and then eight months and a year and. And he didn't die. And um, he, after 25 years, he, he went back to Sloan Kettering to talk to the guys that gave him the terminal diagnosis. And it turned out both of the doctors were dead. W one guy died of a heart attack. The other guy died of cancer or something. And, and, and the idea here is that he returned to a, a diet with low stress, uh, highly nutritious foods uh, consumed in minimal amounts, red wine which we know doesn't spike uh, the glucose ketone index. And uh, he lived a, a stress-free, uh, hi highly organic lifestyle. And lo and behold, now I'm not saying that would happen to everybody, but it certainly is, an, is, is evidence that you can get a, a turnaround in these diseases if you bring your body back into a new state uh, of physiological performance. So, And there's, a, there's bioenergetic rules that explain this. Um, and, and you can link them to bio. This is what we're doing. We're linking some of these things to observable biomarkers to know whether or not things are working. So, uh, again, because cancer is a metabolic disorder, it's not a genetic disorder. 
And the mutations that we see in cancer are all downstream effects of the disturbed energy metabolism. So the field essentially has been focusing on incorrect targets. The target is clearly enhancing energy metabolism through transitional uh, utilization of fermentable and non-fermentable fuels. And this will then uh, slow the growth rate of the tumor and increase overall longevity and, and um, overall general health. And, and we, we and others have worked the bioenergetic principles out for this. And this is why we're seeing people that are these so-called terminal cancer patients. At what point are you terminal for crying out loud? Our, our, colleague, our, our English guy, uh, Bob Lo Kelly, was a glioblastoma, and he was given six months or nine months to live without standard of care. And with standard of care, he would have lived 12 months. So he chose nothing. He did metabolic therapy, and now he's out 10 years survival. And he still has the brain tumor. It's not like it went away. It just went into an indolent state. And he has it debulked every two or three years. But he's still alive. And, and he's terminal, right? I, at some point, we're all terminal if you live long enough. I mean, the, the, the idea here is that these predictions about how long you're going to live are predicted based on you being poisoned and irradiated or treating some sort with treating some sort of toxic therapy that doesn't work. But if you completely change the strategy by which you're managing the disease, some of these predictions are far off. They've made terrible errors in, in missing the target of six or eight months, and now you're out six or eight years. What the hell happened with that? So, uh, um, But I'm not saying that can happen to everybody, but it's happening enough to know that there's something going on here, and that something going on is the relationship of your body to the metabolic state of the cells in your body. And that's what we're beginning to see, and we're applying bioenergetic constants to these things. Can you explain the pressure pulse theory that you've published? Can you just press. explain it in words? A press, not pressure. Press. Press. Okay. This came from the concepts of paleobiology. So these guys that do paleobiology, they study extinctions on the earth. Don't forget our planet is four and a half billion years when it first appeared to arise in the solar system. And it was a hostile environment for uh, a billion years or more. Um, okay. So, uh, but then we had these tremendous explosions of life on the planet. Um, and then for whatever reason, volcanoes, earthquakes, and uh, all this kind of stuff, it was mass ex of extinctions of species. And this was, and it, it was always cor uh, correlated with two things. There was a chronic stress on the environment that would eliminate large numbers of the weak, but not the strong. And then what happened that there would be some catastrophic pulse that would then eliminate the strong ones as well to causing a complete extermination of life forms. And the paleobiologists instituted this concept for uh, ex massive extinctions in terms of oppressed pulse. So I simply adopted that whole concept for how we kill tumor cells. We, we, we press glucose down using diets uh, and exercise. And then we pulse and target the glutamine because glutamine cannot be pressed. It's too valuable of a, a, an amino acid for many systems that require glutamine, like the immune system in the gut. So you have to be strategic when you target glutamine. You cannot just press glutamine uh, ir, 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 indiscriminately or irresponsibly. So this then comes back to the concepts of paleobiology to exterminate mass extinction of the threat to your body, which is the cancer cell, you must be strategic in pressing what you can press because glucose is a non-essential metabolite and then pulsing the, various, the very uh, fuel that is absolutely essential for the growth of the tumor, but essential for other uh, organ systems and cells. But the other organ systems and cells, because they, have a, they can switch to ketone bodies, allows them to survive while you're pulsing the glutamine that's an absolute essential requirement for the tumor cell. Everything makes complete sense based on the laws of biochemistry and, 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 and nature. So once you understand those laws in evolutionary biology, which is how all this stuff started in the first place, then you can strategically go after and destroy the cancer cells. But you, you've got to know how to do this, and you have to be trained to understand what I just said. And then you'd be surprised at the outcome, how successful you become, and you, and you uh, start uh, seriously questioning all these uh, predictions that people are making based on flawed understanding of the situation. 
So basically what, what you're saying, the press pulse is to target the glucose, and we do that through diet, like a ketogenic diet is going to be the best. Well, you, any that diet way. that will lower blood sugar levels, okay? And this was also discovered with the work of epilepsy. This is how we manage epilepsy in kids with seizures. It's clearly related to the, the availability of glucose in the body. And ketogenic diets are a very effective way to maintain low levels of glucose while allowing the brain to function. So, so again, we just adapted the ketone, uh, the epilepsy field that I worked in for many years, and we've learned how to do that for managing seizures. Now, now we just le learn to do it for managing cancer, and a, a cancer responds very, very effectively to these same same kinds of strategies. But that we don't target the glutamine for managing seizures, but we have to target the glutamine for managing cancer because they need that nitrogen from the glutamine to make do, new DNA and RNA and proteins, which are the building blocks for new cells. So clearly we have to take away the fuels that are used for building block it, blocks while at the same time shutting down their ability to make energy. And without energy, nothing, nothing can grow. So the ketones allow the normal cells to continue to make energy, a fuel that the tumor cell cannot use. And then we target the two fuels that the tumor cell uses for making energy and building blocks. And we shut the whole system down gradually. Whether we cure somebody or, or simply manage the disease, we don't know. In some cases, it seems to go away. In other cases, it never goes away, but it never gets really angry or it stays in some sort of an indolent state, which is better than what it, what it would have been. So either way, most patients benefit in one way or the other. And so to really target glutamine, though, like the only way without drugs that we can't get is really fasting with mild exercise, right? Like, yeah, I, 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 that certainly does it. And that might be explaining why some people who, who never take uh, glutamine targeting drugs are able to eliminate their cancers by uh, diet and, and exercise. Uh, I'm, I'm talking water only fasting. You know, this is, and I'm not, I'm talking like weeks of water only fasting and, and intermittent fasting and this kind of thing. Um, and yes, I've seen some incredible uh, responses to this. Uh, the, the, pro the problem is it would happen, I think, a lot faster if we were to target the glutamine in the right way. So it's just, Yes, you can you can achieve success without specifically using glutamine targeting drugs, but I think this but I think the the management would work faster and better if we were able to use glutamine targeting drugs together with the diet and the other the other parts of the metabolic therapy. So a lot of cancer patients like myself included, I never had heard of any of your work or seen of any of your work until it was already too late. I was down to 120 pounds unable to work, so I didn't so fasting and exercise wasn't really an option when you've wasted away to almost nothing. So something I've seen a bunch of doctors talk about is you can, while in a prolonged fast, have high animal fats, um, broth, and butter, basically. So all animal fats. If you're having pure animal fats, it doesn't interrupt your fast. But would that have would that interrupt yeah, I, your I fast? Think, or? I, yes, I, I think I've seen uh, folks. And don't forget that my the colleagues that I work with um, are always uh, keen to those those in, in cancer people with cancer that are on the low end of the weight uh, and the BMI is like below twenty or something. You have to be very careful with these guys. Um, but again, what you just said uh, seems to not jack up uh, the glucose ketone index. So again, uh, you can get uh, superior or excellent nutrition with minimal vegetables and some uh, meats that will allow you to um, maintain a low GKI, putting pressure uh, on the cancer cells because they're, hard, they're very hard for them to grow when, when they're under a low GKI value. So, um, because they need those fermentable fuels uh, to grow. Uh, and that's what cancer is, dysregulated cell growth driven by a fermentation metabolism. So as long as you can restrict those fermentable fuels uh, to those cancer cells, they they're gonna they can't grow fast. There's just no way for them to get energy. It's a minimal. Now it doesn't mean you cure the thing. It just means that you may, you keep that condition in an indolent kind of a state. You live with it. It's like having some, you know, some problem. But you and the cancer seem to live together um, rather than. But every now and then we see a, a much greater uh, removal of the tumor. Um, and I'm not saying it works for everybody, but it works for enough people to say there's something based what's going on here. It looks like it could be a tremendous way to keep people alive with a higher quality of life. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to completely exclude using uh, 
cancer drugs uh, that are part of the so-called standard of care. The, the issue, of course, is you don't have to use as much of this and much lower concentrations. So thereby uh, mitigating a lot of the adverse effects of some of these uh, some of these drugs. So again, we have all right now today, we have all of the necessary uh, uh, procedures and drugs to pro provide uh, long-term management of cancer. Um, we don't need to do any more other than understand better how to use the tools we already have. So, and that's where we have a, a great failing is that we're not clear. We don't have a clear understanding of how to use the, all of the available tools and procedures that we already have. So, so once we better understand the nature of the metabolic problem of cancer, we're going to be able to use radiation and chemo, immunotherapy, and all these different kinds of things that we have available, but use them in the right way, in the right context, rather than uh, not using them in the right way, uh, thereby not exploiting their full uh, power and potential for managing cancer. And that's, that's where an understanding of what the nature of cancer is as a metabolic disease allows us to have a better appreciation of how to use the tools we already have in the right concentrations, uh, dosage, timing, and scheduling. And I, it's, it's a very solvable problem, this cancer thing. Um, it's just that we're not doing it the right way and we don't understand the principles of, 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 of the nature of the problem. And that one of the goals that we have is writing papers over and over again uh, describing this and then, and then having people in the clinic are as exact, exact examples of what can happen when you do it the right way. That's why Maggie and Brad Jones are producing the, the documentary movie on all of this, uh, where they're, um, they're, they're having a registry of folks that are, that are long-term survive all terminal cancer patients should have been dead years ago. And they're all had done metabolic therapy and their faces are there and you can interview them and talk to them. And what did you do? And you find out that they all didn't do the same thing. They all did like different things, uh, all of which are putting pressure on the meta metabolism of the tumor cells in one way or another. So, so this is another uh, um, resource that people can go to and say, I want to talk to those guys. What did they do? What did this colon cancer guy do? What did this brain cancer guy do? What, what did this breast cancer person do? What did the bladder cancer guy do? you know, uh, all of the different types of cancers. What did the blood cancer guy do? You know, the Merkel cell cancer guy. What did the, well, all of them are doing some form of metabolic therapy. Well, what did they do? And then you put it together and they, they all did different things, but they all targeted the glucose and glutamine in one way or the other. And what's so, that documentary called? It's called The Cancer Revolution. And it's put out by Maggie and Brad Jones. And they, and the trailers are out there on the web. Uh, they're, I think they're working on the last part of, of the full, I think it's a four part documentary series. Oh, this is coming. Um, and what Brad and Maggie Jones are doing is they use metabolic therapy. Maggie was terminal. Another one, one of these people, you got six months to live. They always say you got six months to live. Um, well, she's out six years now. And, um, uh, her, she told her husband, a professional documentary movie producer, do a documentary. Why the hell am I alive six years when they told me I had six months to live? because they adapted metabolic therapy. So what is metabolic therapy? And now they're starting to find that all these people with various kinds of cancers are living far longer than what would have been predicted because they, so they said, let's, let's, let's collect all this information. So what they did is they went back and looked at the work of Otto Warburg, who all this essentially comes back to. And uh, we just grabbed the baton from Otto Warburg and ran with it to the next level. And we realized why he made some mistakes and why others have had difficulty interpreting what he did. And we're trying to clear up the mess and then, uh, and then show the, the, the clear path to uh, uh, more successful cancer management uh, to improve quality of life and overall survival. Um, and we never state that we're working on a cure for cancer. We're, 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 we're working on novel ways to manage cancer. Whether it leads to complete resolution or not, we don't know. So, and I think the field has all come falling into this trap of, oh, uh, where's the cure for cancer? Uh, they've kind of like <clears throat> made this term the cure. Forget about it. Uh, if you can manage it long and you can live far longer in a higher quality of life, be grateful for that. Uh, 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 it, it's not like you have a common cold, you take a pill and, the, and you cure your common cold. It, 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 it can be, put it this way, cancer is a manageable disease if done, if, if the tools to manage it are done correctly. So, uh, 
and we can improve on that. And, and um, well, whether we get a cure or not, we don't know, but we can certainly keep people alive longer with a higher quality of life. And I consider that success far greater than what we have today. So if you had cancer and you were unable to get Dawn and you had nothing, what regiment would you follow? Do you think, what would you go on? What regiment? Well, I would get, I would get Dawn for sure. There's no way I would not get it. I ha I know where to get it and how to get it because I'm a scientist. So I have access to this. So, um, uh, but if you couldn't get it, what would if you I then? couldn't get Dawn, uh, I, I would have to do, um, well, I would have to do the long-term water only fasts. Uh, I would have to, take their parasite drugs, and bendazole, fenbendazole. They do work on glucose and glutamine targeting. Uh, I would get my ketones as high as I could. I would keep maintain a low GKI. I would explore whatever kind of a diet uh, food that I would take whatever, uh, to keep my GKI low. Do what Moriatis did from um, the Mediterranean guy there. I mean, we know this is capable. Uh, it, yeah, it, it, would, it would be easier if I had done, but if I didn't have done, and, and at least I would know that uh, if I didn't survive from all I did, at least I know I tried and I worked with something that I understood and I, and at least I would be dying from the disease uh, rather than from the treatment of the disease. Uh, right now, 50% of the cancer patients are dying from the treatments, not from cancer. So, so uh, I, I would know that I would be dying. I gave it my best shot. I, I did whatever I could do with the knowledge that I have. At least I knew that I died from cancer and not from some poisonous thing they gave me to manage it, where I would be dead from that. Um, uh, and I, I, I wouldn't subject my body to any level of toxicity uh, in any kind of a therapy that I, that I would take. Everything would be based on my understanding of the bioenergetics of the system. And yes, I would be trial and error a lot of things and always maintaining my GKI. And the bottom line, how do you feel? Uh, you don't have to ask. I mean, you talk to a cancer patient, you're saying, oh, I feel pretty good, you know? And you know, the, fun, the, the funny thing about it is, is um, when many, many people are diagnosed for the first time with cancer, they often say, well, I didn't really know I had it. And I, I didn't feel too bad. I, I knew I had some problem here, but I didn't know it was going to it was going to kill me. Well, then when they start poisoning and irradiate you, and the next thing you know, you are killed. Uh, who knows whether the cancer is killing you or the treatments are killing you? The, the, the idea here is that you want to know you're going to die from the disease because you, 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 you knew how to manage it the best you could. So, yeah, I mean, I would be. And then, of course, I would talk to my colleagues that I have trained <laughs> in understanding this. And they're on the front lines treating patient after patient after patient. And they would have a, a, a more direct uh, experience in knowing how different people respond to different parts of the, of the press pulse uh, therapy. And I would certainly be in consultation uh, with them. So, uh, and I would hang on, fight it as long as I could, uh, knowing uh, what I know about the nature of the disease. And if I lost the battle eventually, at least I'm battling it. This whole term that, oh, I'm battling, no, you're not battling your cancer. You're sitting there like some uh, uh, bystander being poisoned and irradiated by a system that really has no understanding of what the biology of the disease they're treating. At least I'm, I'm fighting it. I am, I would be battling the disease known with my knowledge of biochemistry and physiology. I'm battling my disease and I'm ultimately responsible for my existence on the planet. And if I'm doing it the right way, I might exist a little longer. So, so um, yeah, there's a lot of ways to, to uh, battle this disease, but the term battling it when you're not doing anything, Metabolic therapy puts the burden of, of success on the shoulders of the patient themselves. I have all these people emailing me and they say, oh, you know, I'm doing all what you say, but I can't get my GKI down. And I said, what are you eating? Well, I, I, I like bread every now and then. Well, for crying out loud, man, you can't get your GKI down if you're eating bread. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, this is called scientific literacy. And if you're uh, scientifically illiterate, you might as well go pick out your gra gravestone now. So... <laughs> So this is the, this is what you have to know, uh, you know. It's just th these kinds of things. Don't you can't blame anybody uh, about anything. It's on your shoulders. You got to know the right thing to do. You're in control of your destiny, and metabolic therapy allows you to wield the power of your own body's ability to 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 resist these things and adapt. 
And cancer cells cannot adapt. They're locked into this fermentation metabolism. So they're very, all these things, cancer cells are adaptable. No, they're not adaptable. They're full of gene mutations and they can't, they can't uh, get energy except through fermentation. Therefore, you know how to trap and kill them. Uh, and you can do it when you, when you have this knowledge. 50% of people die from treatment. Now, is that just radiation and chemo or does that include immune therapy? Like what kind of long-term damage is immune therapy doing to people? Because it seems to be far less toxic still than chemo and radiation. Uh, well, yeah, well, there's a, a, a term you should know. It's called hyperprogressive disease associated with immune therapy. Okay. And there's a lot of papers written on this. It's a dark side, the dark side of what you, how I did, when, when you take a, immunotherapy, did the physicians tell you about hyperprogressive disease? No. Why not? Because they should, for Christ's sake. Th this is a well-documented phenomenon in the scientific literature. Uh, immunotherapies can be very effective in about 20% of the people. Immunotherapies are mostly no different than doing whatever in about 60% of the people. But in 20% of the people, the immunotherapy will cause the accel rapid acceleration of the growth of the tumor and killing you faster than you would have uh, had. It's called, it's a well-known phenomenon called hyperprogressive disease. Every oncologist should know that and should share that uh, information with you. There's dozens of papers written in the scientific literature for all these different kinds of cancers called hyperprogressive disease associated with immunotherapies. Some of it can be uh, what we call tumor lysis syndrome. Okay. This is where you would have a lot of cancer cells in your body and you would take an immunotherapy and it would be so effective, you'd kill all the tumor cells simultaneously, releasing all of the toxins into your bloodstream, blowing out your kidneys and liver, and then killing you through a hyperprogressive uh, disorder like that. And then there's other ways that you can take a tumor and you can see, wow, look at the tumor shrink. Now, what happens is in combination with the tumor shrinking, all of a sudden you see a lot of with the blood work, you'll start to see an explosion of inflammatory cytokines like C-reactive protein, ferritin, and some of these other things start, your, your blood work becomes out of whack. And then several months later, this damn tumor comes exploding back at you. So, so uh, and these are all documented events in the literature. So, so um, all, of these, all of these should be discussed with the patient. Um, and, and, and that's what I'm saying. A lot of times they're not looking at all the different markers that are going to predict what's going to happen. And what we know about is we have to be constantly looking at GK. It's, 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 you have to watch all the biomarkers and how they're responding to the treatments that you take. I mean, if you take a treatment and that it massively increases inflammatory cytokines in your bloodstream, this is not good. If you take a treatment that ex accelerates blood sugar and, and glutamine levels in your, in your system, this is not good. OK, when you that, the reason why we have made no advances in managing brain cancer, glioblastoma in 100 years, because the standard of care frees up massive amounts of glucose and glutamine in the person's brain, killing the person because they freed up all this. This is all when you understand biology and biochemistry of your adversary. You would never do some of the crazy stuff that we're doing to these cancer patients. And you ask the oncologist what I'm telling you, and as you said, they never heard of any of this stuff. They don't read the scientific literature like I do, and they don't do the experiments in the lab like I do. And they don't look at the, they're told by a system, and the system itself is based on a flawed theory. So you put it all together, and in the United States, we have 1,700 people a day dying from cancer, which is 70 an hour. 70 people in the United States are dying each hour from cancer because of a system that lacks knowledge on the underlying underpinnings of what the nature of the disease is. It's not, this is all I mean. What I'm saying is based on, on the, the evidence in the literature that apparently nobody seems to read or understand. It's malpractice, isn't it? Well, I, 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 I don't want to be the one to say that. But, I'll say it. It yeah, sounds well, like malpractice to me. Uh, well, there's a, certain, there's a certain level of malpractice that you have to recognize. Um, if the oncologists don't and never heard of this and were never trained in their training to hear this, then it's a lack of knowledge. Um, it, it, it's uh, uh, negligence, a lack of knowledge, um, uh, wh which is not excusable. But on the other hand, like in the brain cancer field, uh, where I have showed many papers and discussed how r the radiation of the brain tumor frees up massive amounts of glucose 
and glutamine and how steroids make the, the blood sugar go up. And you now know why you don't survive where uh, uh, 90, 98% of people are dead uh, within five years. Um, and you know what I've said, and you've looked at the data and then you continue to do that, knowing that that's going to kill your patient. That might be considered uh, malpractice because it's one thing to not know about it, which is like negligence. Uh, is another thing to know what you're doing and you continue to do it. That's immoral. And um, uh, 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 the largest dose of uh, steroids, de dexamethasone that I received was, I can't remember if it was 36 milligrams or 46 milligrams because yeah. I had an allergic reaction to chemo. So I bet that would have been one heck of a glucose spike that oh, day. Oh yeah. Everybody should look at their blood sugar. Um, and this is, and you know, it's feeding the beast. So, uh, and that causes anxiety. And then when you take, get back on the right metabolic path and you see the blood sugar going down and the GKI going down, that reduces anxiety. So, so there's so many ways you can manage the beast um, uh, if you know what you're doing and how to do it. The, the tragedy is that your caregiver, who should be working with you a, 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 as a coach, uh, has no clue or is, a, a, a never heard of what I'm talking about, never was trained to understand this. So this is the great tragedy. It's that we have the knowledge, we have the procedures, but the, the field does not yet know or understand it. And, and that's, I don't know what we do to, to change that. And, and it's happening in Canada and it's happening in the United States and it's happening in England and Germany and France and Poland and China and Korea and Japan and in Brazil and in Chile and in Australia and in New Zealand and in India, and in Saudi Arabia, and you can just go around the world to all the different countries, and all the same stuff is happening there. <laughs> Holy, we've come up to an hour. Do you have a few more minutes, or is that? Well, I, I have to, I'm actually scheduled uh, to meet with somebody very shortly, so. Okay, well, that'll be it for today, then, so I'll uh, end the recording now. Thanks, everybody, for joining, and I hope this was informative.